Okay, we're ready to get started. All right. Um, welcome to the third webinar in the Weeks of Learning and Doing webinar series hosted by the Masorti Environmental Sustainability Initiative, or otherwise fondly known, known as MESI. And with a generous grant from Kakal, MESI was launched on Tu Bishvat this year to provide living, to promote living sustainably and taking action to fight climate change within the conservative movement's institutions. Messi's first step was to enhance the conservative movement's partnership with Adama's Jewish Climate Leadership Coalition. Uh, this is a program that supports synagogues in their efforts to create their own climate action plans. And to date, almost 70 congregations have registered for the coalition. Messi has also collaborated with rabbis and scholars to create a unique set of weekly insights and teachings on sustainability that enhance and our celebration of the Omer, which you can find on exploringjudaism.org. And now the Weeks of Learning and Doing webinar series is taking place, inspired by the same disciplines we are using in our weekly Omer teachings, learning, service, and loving kindness. The webinar series is a highly curated movement-wide online event that offers education, information, and resources about environmental sustainability from a Jewish perspective. And some of some examples of our webinars are capital planning from an environmental perspective, helping to ensure a healthy world, the mitzvah of Yeshuv HaOlam, um, and cultivating spiritual courage and confronting the climate crisis. Um, and the one we will hear today, which is called Calling Planet Earth to the Bima. Messi has partnered with um, various arms of the movement and some fabulous external partners like Colorado Jewish Climate Action um, to offer this one of a kind webinar series about the environment and climate change that will inspire and motivate action and advocacy. And we hope it will inspire and motivate you to enhance your sustainability actions and commitment to protect planet Earth, our common home. The way we we speak about climate change matters. Our first speaker, Moshe Kornfeld of Jewish, uh, of Colorado Jewish Climate Action, will discuss the intersection of climate communication and Judaism. And our second speaker, our main speaker, Malika Talwar, who is the Deputy Partnerships Director for U.S. and India from the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, will discuss uh, results of um the program's research and communication best practices. After the um, speakers present, we'll have um, any of your chats that you have put in the chat box, any of your questions or comments um, in the chat box, they will be curated by Moshe and we can address them and have a conversation and some um, discussion at the end. And um, at the very end, we'll have an outro from Rabbi Sarah Blumenthal. She's the assistant rabbi at Congregation Agudath Israel in Caldwell, New Jersey. Um, Sarah has played a really crucial role in supporting our webinar series and content and the process, um, as well as crafting beautiful Omer content for um, our collaboration with Exploring Judaism. And finally, a big thank you goes out to CJCA for partnering with us to host this webinar. And now I'm excited to formally introduce today's speakers. Um, Moshe Kornfeld will introduce. Moshe Kornfeld is the founder and executive director of Colorado Jewish Climate Action. He serves as the Chazan of Congregation Rodef Shalom in Denver. As CJCA director, Moshe works to inspire Colorado Jews and Colorado Jewish institutions to embrace bold climate action. Moshe holds a PhD in cultural anthropology and has taught courses about the intersections of religion, environmentalism, and politics at CU Boulder, Washington University in St. Louis, and the University of Denver. He lives in Denver with his wife and two children. And our main speaker, um, who we're really excited to welcome, Malika Talwar, serves as the Deputy Director of Partnerships, U.S. and, and India, for the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. She supports the program's efforts to build the capacity of partner organizations for strategic and data-driven communications and advocacy. Prior to working at YPCCC, Malika worked as a senior oceans campaigner for Greenpeace USA, 
leading an international campaign to end environmental and human rights abuses in global fisheries supply chains. She also has extensive experience advocating for environmental protection in her home country, India. Malika holds a master's in environmental management from the Yale School of Environment. Okay, and thank you all so much for joining us. Moshe, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm grateful for the partnership with, of, with the Masorti Environmental Sustainability Initiative and to Malika from the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication for joining us to share some key insights. My name is Moshe Kornfeld, and I'm the Executive Director of Colorado Jewish Climate Action. CJCA seeks to transform Colorado Jewish life by bringing climate action to the forefront of the Jewish communal agenda. Working with secular, interfaith, and frontline allies, we pursue bold, just solutions and bold solutions to the climate crisis. I'd like to start off our webinar this evening with some musings about the intersections of Jewish teachings and climate communication. Let's start with the Shema, one of our key foundational texts. Hear, O Israel, Hashem is our God, Hashem alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Take to heart these instructions with which I charge you this day. Impress them upon your children. Recite them when you stay at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them serve as a symbol on your forehead. Inscribe them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. This creed teaches us to take our deepest truths and share them with concentric circles, starting with the self and moving outwards. We are first obligated to internalize these truths, then to teach them to our family, to inscribe them on our bodies, to build them into our home designs, and then to integrate them into the very structure of our neighborhoods and cities. In other words, we are obligated to create a cultural system that encodes our commitments. This is the cultural work of the climate movement, work that Jewish communities and other faith groups equipped with the tools, tools to imagine the world as it should be, need to be doing. If you are on this call, you likely think frequently about the reality and existential threat of anth anthropogenic climate change. Climate thought leaders often emphasize the importance of talking about climate change as a form of climate action. The Shema Creed offers insight into why talking about climate change is so critical. At the heart of any ethical system is a socio-educational framework for communicating and disseminating those basic values we hold dear. Jewish communities and other commu faith communities, more generally, have the capacity to serve as vehicles for spreading the Torah of creation, to embrace and disseminate our deep commitments to a just and livable future. Further, I'd like to suggest that our liturgical resources might help us stave off climate despair and lift up climate hope. In liberal Jewish circles, the second paragraph of Shema was historically kept at arm's length. And I'll quote again, if then you obey the commandments that I enjoin upon you this day, loving your God and serving God with all your heart and soul, I will grant the rain for you for your land in season, the early rain and the late. You shall gather in your new grain and wine and oil, I will also provide grass in the field for your cattle, and thus you shall eat your fill. Take care not to be lured away to serve other gods and bow to them. For Hashem's anger will flare up against you, shutting up the sky so that there will be no rain and the ground will not yield its produce. And you will soon perish from the good land that Hashem is assigning to you. Many, including myself, are uncomfortable with the idea of a vengeful God who manipulates natural systems in response to human action. As a result, this paragraph is often recited silently and even omitted in many contemporary liturgies. And yet these, worlds, uh, and yet these words are more relevant than ever. In response to overlapping ecological crises, we must embrace the second paragraph of Shema as a call to climate action, as a reminder that our decisions and policies will have a profound impact on our planet. 1.5 degrees of warming is better than two degrees, and two degrees is significantly better than 2.2 or 2.5 degrees. Our job is to communicate both the disturbing reality of the climate crisis and to serve as a beacon of hope. We must continue to communicate to ourselves, to our families, 
on our BIMAs and in our social media feeds, that climate change is here and now, and that, and that our actions will continue to determine the future. I'd like to conclude with one final thought about the intersections of Jewish wisdom and climate communication. In Judaism, there's a concept of tochecha, of sacred rebuke. In the Jewish legal formulation of tochecha, one is not permitted to rebuke an individual who is unlikely to listen, listen to that rebuke. The Talmud in Yevamot 65b states that, just as it is a mitzvah for a person to say that's that which will be heeded, so it is a mitzvah for a person not to say that which, that which will not be heeded. One should not rebuke those who will be unreceptive to their message. Rabbi Abba says it is obligatory for him to refrain from speaking as it is said, do not repro reprove a scorner lest he hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. As far as I understand, these insights correlate with climate, climate communication best practices. Effective communication is not about convincing uncle, I know better than the climate scientist Joe, that they are misinformed. The goal is to engage and activate the majority of people who think that climate change is real and that we should do something about it. Climate tochacha is the daily work of creating the political and cultural world we need, we need in order to pursue a just and livable future for our children and grandchildren. We must encourage, inspire, motivate, cajole, energize, and galvanize those who understand our predicament but aren't sure how to get involved. We do this by talking about climate change, by gathering in virtual and real sanctuaries, and by building community around the sacred ecological mission. Thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to Malika. Thank you so much, Moshe, for so beautifully grounding our conversation today. Um, um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here to speak to you all. Um, my name is Malika, Malika Dalbar, and I'm the Deputy Partnerships Director at the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. Um, I'd just like to call on uh, another member of my team who's here to support me today to just quickly introduce herself, Alison. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alison Thompson. I am a second year graduate student at the Yale School of the Environment and the Student Partnerships Team Manager. So really grateful to be here and we'll be answering any questions that come up in the chat. Um, great. So I am uh, very excited to have this opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, and um, about strategic climate communication. I realized that I'm not sharing my screen. Sorry, give me a second. Um, can you see my slides now? Great. Um, so I will be speaking to you about strategic climate communication and sharing some data-driven insights and tools that I hope um, you will find useful as you think about how to communicate on climate to your audiences. Um, so I thought it would be good to start with a quick introduction to who we are and what we do. The Yale Program on Climate Change Communications is an independent research institute at the Yale School of the Environment. And essentially what we do is we study what people think, feel, and believe about climate change. We also study um, what their people's attitudes are and what their behavior is as it relates to climate change. We educate decision makers and the wider public about climate change. So um, our partnerships team, uh, which is um, whom I'm representing today, uh, we specifically work to help climate advocates, educators, businesses, faith leaders, um, governments, elected officials, and essentially anyone looking to communicate on climate change um, and to build sort of uh, public and political will for climate action. It's our role to help these groups um, understand our research and um, help grow their capacity for more strategic and data-driven advocacy. And we essentially we do this because um, it is our vision that public and political will secures a safe and stable climate for everyone. So let's get started. Um, the very first rule of communication is to know your audience. This is because knowing your audience allows you to understand them and to meet them where they are at. It helps you to tailor your message and by doing that, maximize the chances that your message will be successful at reaching the goal that you're trying to reach. It also allows you to build trust and avoid any sort of misunderstandings or alienation. 
So when it comes to communicating on climate change uh, or for climate policy, we need to start by understanding, especially in the US, we need to start by understanding what Americans already know and feel about these issues. Now, I know that for many of you, your audience is a subset of Americans, right? Uh, we're talking about Jewish communities today. Um, but I thought that before we dive into sort of specifics about Jewish communities in the US, I thought it would be good to ground our conversation in a baseline understanding of where Americans are as a whole. And then we can dive into um, details about specific um, groups that are of interest. So a good place to start um, to get to know, to understand what Americans feel about these issues is our twice yearly nationally representative survey, the Climate Change in the American Mind Survey. Uh, we've been conducting these surveys since 2008, um, and we have therefore been able to track Americans' shifting beliefs, opinions, and policy, policy support um, on climate for over a decade now. So I'll dive into the data, and I think the first question that um, we ask in our data is what percentage of Americans overall believe that climate change is happening, that global warming is happening. Um, but before I share that data, does anyone want to guess in the chat how many Americans think global warming is happening? 70%. Oh, okay, I hear the right answer right off the bat, so, which is always great um, to hear. Yeah, seeing some 70%. Um, that is correct. More than seven out of 10 Americans think that global warming is happening. And Americans who think global warming is happening outnumber those who think it's not happening by a ratio of nearly five to one. So 72% think it's happening versus 15% who think um, it's not happening. Um, it's also important to note that a majority of Americans think that global warming is mostly human caused. Um, so 61%, oh, 58% as of our latest survey, um, think that it's uh, that it's human cause, as opposed to 29% who think it's just natural changes in the environment. Now, here is where it gets interesting. It's one thing to think that global warming is happening, but it's um, entirely another thing to actually be worried about it and to see it as an issue of concern. So when we look at the data, what we find is that two thirds of Americans are either somewhat or very worried about global warming and when you zoom into those who report being very worried, that's that dark green bar at the bottom here, that's almost two, almost one third of Americans. And it's double of what we reported a decade ago. So essentially what we're seeing is that Americans are increasingly worried about global warming. Now, because of the type of issue that climate change is, it can often feel like it is distant in time and space. What I mean by that is people tend to think that this is something that will impact future generations or people in developing countries or polar bears, but not us and not the people and places and things around us that we care about right here, right now, right? Um, so our data actually shows that many Americans are starting to make the connection that global warming will harm them personally. It's not a majority, it's less than 50%, but it's still a sizable percentage who are seeing that it will, um, global warming will impact them personally, either a moderate amount or a great deal. But that psychological distance definitely still persists because many more Americans think that it will harm people in developing countries or future generations. So that was all good news for those of us wanting to communicate on climate change. Now for some of the bad news. Um, we've seen that, a, a, so far we've seen that a majority of Americans believe that global warming is happening, that it's human caused, they're even worried about it, and many, many think that it will harm them, and yet most Americans rarely or never discuss global warming with family and friends. So you can see here 66% of Americans rarely or never discuss global warming, whereas only 34% report often or occasionally discussing um, this with their family and friends. And there are many reasons for this. I'm sure um, you all um, have some ideas about what these reasons are. But, the, but one reason that I want to highlight today is um, this fact that Americans aren't perceiving social norms for taking action on global warming. Social norms are the cues that we take from our friends and family and from the people around us that we love and respect about how to behave and what to think. 
right? And they're an incredibly powerful motivator for action, for uh, shaping people's beliefs and behaviors. So when it comes to climate change, uh, what we find in our data is that less than half of Americans are seeing uh, their family and friends making an effort to reduce global warming. And less than half of Americans think that global warming is something that is important to their family and friends. And as a result, what happens is that we're not perceiving these social norms. Um, and on top of that, a lot of Americans underestimate how many others believe that global warming is happening. And so what this essentially contributes to is this spiral of climate silence, where even though we may be worried about it, about climate change, we don't talk about it because we don't think it's something that's important to the people around us, right? To the people that we love and respect. So we're afraid to talk about it. And because we don't talk about it, others around us who are taking cues from us think that it's not important to us. And then they don't talk about it, right? And so on and on, that sort of spiral of climate silence goes. So we'll be spending some time talking about how to address these challenges in a bit. Um, but I just want to close out sort of this first data section with uh, one last data point, um, which I think is particularly relevant to our conversation today. How many Americans are seeing climate change as a moral issue? So as of 2021, um, that was the last time that we asked this question, many Americans are seeing climate change as a moral issue, almost 50%. Um, and this actually has risen from 36% in 2015. So um, we've seen quite a large jump in just um, six years. Um, and so what this means is that Americans are increasingly seeing climate change as a moral issue. So there's clearly an opportunity for us to be reaching out to these groups using faith-based messages and even to expand this group, right? By reaching out to others um, and helping them see the connections between climate change and moral values. So, so far I shared national averages with you, um, but of course we know that there's a lot of geographic variation in terms of beliefs and attitudes. What I mean by that is that people in, the, in different parts of the US have varying levels of beliefs and support for climate action uh, and for climate policies. So we, we came up with this tool, the Yale Climate Opinion Maps. And what these maps essentially do is they take our data from the Climate Change in the American Mind surveys um, and they estimate the percentage of American adults in specific geographies who um, have certain opinions on climate change, right? Um, and so they have this data for the national level, of course, but they also have data at the state level by congressional district, a metropolitan area, and county. So this tool is incredibly helpful if you're trying to determine where to work based on where there is more support for climate action, um, or, or if you're focused on persuading people who remain unconvinced, you can focus in on areas where there's, there, there's less support for climate action. Um, it's also helpful uh, to get a better sense of what your audience in your specific um, sort of target geography believes, right? What policies enjoy more support in your region or in your community? So there's geographic variation in climate beliefs, but also within any sort of any selected geographic area, it's important to understand that people aren't the same. People have different psychological, cultural, and political reasons for either believing in or not believing in, for acting or not acting to address climate change. Um, Americans, we often think that they divide neatly into these two categories with climate activists on one side and opponents on the other side. But in fact, what we found is that Americans respond to the climate issue in different ways. Our research has identified global warming six Americas. These are six unique audiences within the American public that each respond to the issue in their own distinct way. So here are the six Americas um, arranged from left to right in decreasing order of belief in, motivation to act, and concern about climate change. Um, so the first audience we have up here are the alarmed. The alarmed are convinced that global warming is happening, human caused and an urgent threat, and they strongly support climate policies. But most of the alarmed don't know what they or others can do to address the problem. The next group are the concerned. The concerned think that human caused global warming is happening. They also think it's a serious threat. They also support climate policies. 
But this is the group that tends to believe that climate impacts are still distant in time and space. And so for them, climate change remains a lower priority issue. Next up, we have the cautious. The cautious, as their name suggests, haven't made up their mind. They're wondering, is global warming happening? Is it human caused? Is it serious? Should they care about it? Um, next, we have the disengaged. The disengaged actually know very little about global warming. They rarely or never hear about it in the media. They don't think about it much. Um, and these are the folks, these are folks who just have too much going on um, in their lives. They're trying to make ends meet. So this is just not an issue that they think about. And they're generally very hard to reach. Next up, we have the doubtful. The doubtful don't think global warming is happening. So here's where we're starting to move into sort of denial and um, sort of disbelief. So the doubtful don't think global warming is happening and they believe that, that or they believe that it's just a natural cycle um, that's not human caused. Um, they don't think too much about the issue though or consider it a serious risk. And then finally, we have the dismissive. The dismissive believe global warming is not happening. They're convinced that it's not happening or that if it is, it's not human caused or a threat. And these are the folks who tend to endorse a lot of conspiracy theories like global warming as a whole. So they do think a lot about it. It's just that they're convinced that it's not real. So now that I've shared who these audiences are, does anyone want to guess which of these is the largest um, segment in terms of percentage of American population? Once again, you can drop your guesses in the chat. Okay, I'm hearing, I'm seeing some concern, some disengaged concern, cautious. Okay, so we have answers all across the spectrum, which is great. Um, concern. Okay, so let me let me show you the right answer. <clears throat> the alarmed and concerned are actually tied for first spot, even though technically the concern is the largest group. Twenty-eight and twenty-nine percent are not statistic statistically distinguishable. So they're close enough that. They're essentially the same. Um, and it's important to know that together, the alarmed and the concerned actually make up a majority of the American population, right? On the other hand, we should also know that our strongest opponents, the dismissive, are actually a very small minority. They're just 11%. It just so happens that, you know, they tend to be loud and they occupy a lot of space. So we think that they are a much larger portion of the population than they actually are. So over the years, we've been seeing that Americans are increasingly alarmed. Um, there's been a 13 percentage point increase um, in the alarm. And at the same time, we're seeing a decrease in the cautious and doubtful segments. So we're seeing movement in the right direction, which is great. And I think that's a testament to the work of all of the groups in this space who have been communicating on climate change. Now, because the six Americas differ so much in their beliefs and their motivations to act, we need to be using different strategies to engage them. Each of the six Americas have different questions they are wondering about that we can help answer. The alarm they're eager to know what individual and collective actions they can take to help reduce global warming. It, and this is really important to keep in mind, just because they're alarmed doesn't mean they're all taking the actions that we need them to be taking, right? Many of them, don't know what they can do about the issue. So with them, we need to highlight the solutions that exist, connect them to, to those solutions, make it easy for them to take those actions. Um, and we need to be recruiting them to our organizations, organizing them and mobilizing them to support climate policies. The concern also need to be organized, recruited. They also need solutions messaging. But in that case, we also need to educate them about the urgency of climate change and make climate change uh, um, personally relevant and make it clear that it's here, right here, right now, right? It's impacting us right now. With the cautious and the doubtful, the focus needs to be on persuading and educating these audiences since they're unsure if climate change is happening and if it's human caused um, and whether it's urgent or not. So once again, really leaning in on um, communication that conveys the personal relevance of climate change um, and Communication that establishes climate change as a here, us, now problem um, is what can really help move these audiences along. Now, finally, with the dismissive, because the dismissive reject climate change as an issue of concern, it can be really difficult. I'm sure we've all had these experiences uh, with 
um, dismissive folks in our lives, it can be really difficult to communicate about climate change with this group. And sometimes communicating on climate change can even create backlash. So in general, our recommendation uh, with this group is to avoid communicating with this audience. Um, and to be honest, we really don't have the time to argue with outright deniers, right? Especially since they make up such a tiny minority. So much more work needs to be done to educate, persuade, and move other audiences to solutions that our recommendation is to focus on that instead of wasting time and resources trying to move this very immovable audience. So those were the six Americas across the American public. Um, but in general, most of us are rarely communicating with Americans at large, right? We all have our own specific audiences um, in our specific, specific geographies that we are focusing on. So we created a short four question survey tool called the Six Americas Sh Super Short Survey or SASI for short, which is a name I really love. Um, and so essentially what you can do is you can use this survey tool to segment your own audience and see where they land on the Six Americas. Many of our partners have used this survey tool to segment their own membership through their email lists, um, uh, member-based organizations have um, surveyed their membership. Um, museums have segmented their visitors um, using this tool. And then based on the findings of where their audiences land and where their audiences are in the Six Americas, they've honed in on very specific strategies of communication, like the ones that I shared earlier. Okay, so I shared a lot of, I threw a lot of data at you uh, for the past 15 minutes. Um, the question now is how do we apply this data um, to develop effective strategies and what works? Now to develop effective strategies to get people to take action, we need to first ask what is preventing people from taking action? Um, we asked a version of this question in our surveys, um, but we focus specifically on political actions such as calling a representative or signing a petition or volunteering with a local group. And what we found were, was that there were five main barriers preventing people from taking action on climate change, it's even if they're alarmed or concerned, right? So here are the five barriers. Um, one, nobody has ever asked me. And this is one of the largest barriers. People don't know what to do and no one who they like and respect has asked them to take action. It wouldn't make a difference. I'm not an activist. I don't know who to contact. I wouldn't know what to say. So we know that many people are actually at a loss as to what to say, what steps to take, how to go about doing anything, and can all feel very overwhelming. So as climate communicators, it is our job to help our audiences see that these actions are within reach to simplify the process of taking these actions and really just help them um, get to the solutions that, that we wanna promote, right? Other research has also found that people take action when they are asked to participate, when they want to participate, when they have the resources to do so, and when they have participated before. So this is really important to keep in mind. There's this focus, we need this focus on building communities of action, where once people take action, that begets more action, right? So helping create these spaces where people feel supported um, and are connected to the solutions around us. So grounded in this understanding of what prevents people from supporting action, here are a few strategies uh, for promoting it on climate. So um, I will talk about these more in depth, but I'll just mention these really quickly right now. We need to be using tested and data-driven messaging strategies. We need to ask people directly to take action. We need to amplify pro-climate social norms. We need to strengthen perceptions of collective efficacy and encourage people to talk about climate change. So when it comes to strat messaging st strategies that are data-driven, um, we recently conducted a global study of 23 major countries with our partners at Potentially Energy, where we measured beliefs, attitudes, opinions, policy support, and so on. We also tested different messages to diverse audiences in these countries. Um, and when I say 23 major countries, that includes the US and the G20, essentially. Um, what we found was that there was one message that stood out in every single country. The biggest motivation was not jobs. It wasn't reducing the costs of extreme weather. It was 
protecting the people, places, and things that we love, especially when our children's future is at risk. And so we call this winning message the later is too late message. So later is too late to protect the people, places, and things that we love, and our children's future is at stake. Um, and this message, we found that it performed much better than others that we tested. Um, and on the right, you can see parts of this message that resonated the most, right? So you don't have to be a scientist to see how our climate has changed. Most importantly, it's putting our children's futures at risk. It's our responsibility to leave behind the safe, livable world for future generations. So essentially, this message is combining this urgency to act with this generational language. And I think this is particularly well suited for you all, as this links up very well with moral values about protection and care. So in, in your case, I think it would be helpful to think about how can we leverage this message frame and combine it with Jewish values of uh, that protection and care, as Moshe um, stated in the beginning of this call, um, and come up with a message frame that resonates with your communities. So here's an example of how our friends at Interfaith Power and Light um, used a similar message frame in their Faith Climate Voters campaign in 2020 and 2022. So essentially, vote for our children's future. Our values call us to be good stewards of our sacred earth and ensure that everyone is cared for. Beyond the latest too late messages, a message, there are also other ways to get people involved. As faith leaders, many people in your communities are looking up to you and, and have immense respect um, towards you. Um, asking them to directly take action can be a big mo motivator. Our research has found that many registered voters would take political action to reduce global warming if they were asked by people who they like and respect. So this is a superpower, right, that we have, um, especially with our friends and family and our faith communities. And we need to be leaning into this more. That brings me to the importance of creating social norms around believing in and supporting climate action. Messages that highlight overwhelming support in people's own communities or groups for certain climate-friendly behaviors or actions can, can really help build these social norms. So here's an example of that in action. One of our partners um, that was focusing on a climate education campaign used our data from our climate change in the American Mind surveys um, in these ads. So they were trying to recruit teachers with these um, digital ads to their climate education program. And they're highlighting that a majority of adults believe that students should learn about climate change at school. So that's a social norm message in action. Now, while we haven't done a study on religious groups for a while, um, there are other groups who have uh, data on American Jewish communities and their beliefs on climate action. So for instance, the Public Religion Research Institute's 2023 survey found that a large majority of Jews in the US believe that climate change is real, so 67%, and that it's human-caused, right? Um, in fact, the same survey also found that among religious groups, Jewish communities have the largest percentage of people who report being concerned about climate change and who see climate change as a crisis. So building this fact into your messaging can really help build social norms around um, Jewish communities taking action on climate change. And it's it's so simple, right? It's just stating this fact that there is overwhelming support for climate action in our communities. It is also our job as communicators to help show our audiences, especially the alarmed and concerned who are very susceptible to feelings of hopelessness and doom, that there is hope and that they do, their actions matter and their actions have the ability to create change. We refer to this as collective efficacy, boosting feelings of collective efficacy. So um, here's an example of an efficacy message in action. That same group that was focusing on climate education um, in the same ads are helping educators see that they have the power to equip young people with the tools they need to act on climate change. So again, thinking about how we can use that in our spaces, in our um, communities. Finally, I'll, um, I'll just end by talking about the power of storytelling. Um, I have been talking data at you for a while now, but science, facts, and data can only take us so far. When it comes to effective climate communication, we really need to be winning hearts and minds. And storytelling is one of our most powerful tools for doing so. 
We need to use stories to connect the dots between climate change and the people, places, and things that Americans care about. Um, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres recently said that climate change is an everything, everywhere, all at once issue, right? Which is a challenge for us, but it's also an advantage. We need to be leaning into this, this fact that climate is inherently connected to everything around us and using that to build out these stories, right? About how climate change impacts the things we care about. How is climate change connected to our religious and moral values? as well as to energy, extreme weather, public health, jobs, economy, you name it, right? Um, so Yale Climate Con Connections, which is our multimedia news service, has thousands of stories that do just this. They draw these connections between climate change and the things that Americans and others worldwide care about. This is actually a great story bank to even lean on when thinking about climate storytelling. Um, so I just pulled out one story that Yale Climate Connections did about Jewish communities. So you can you can go um, and take a look at their sort of uh, story bank and see if there are others that um, relate to your communities and, and the work that's going on. Another important connection to build out is how do our places of worship feature in the climate story? How can we use the power of these spaces, both as physical spaces, right, um, for climate solutions, but also as meeting places where we can develop community um, to act on climate change, to build our climate values, find common ground and move the conversation forward. Um, and so one example of this is our friends at Interfaith Power and Light have this uh, project um, called Cool Congregations where they're essentially helping people of faith make changes in their homes and places of worship to prevent global warming. Um, and so they have a toolkit, they have steps, and they have a community of support to help groups that are looking to make these changes. So I would highly recommend that um, you take a look and get in touch if this is something that would be of interest. Um, so I'll just end quickly um, also by saying that when it comes to the urgency of climate change, we really need to help people see that the impacts are here and now and help them see themselves in the impacts. So see that they, that climate change is impacting people like them, right? People who look like them, people who have similar beliefs as them. And so we need to be telling these human stories. At the same time, we also need to help people see themselves in the solutions. They need to see people who look like them, who have similar beliefs as them, taking climate action, right? So that's uh, once again where uh, there's a huge opportunity for us to talk about how Jewish communities are leading on this, right? There are so many examples of groups that are taking action. So we need to be telling the stories of these groups and individuals um, to inspire others. others. Um, we recently also developed a breakdown of what makes a compelling climate story. Um, essentially, uh, breaking it down to the elements that um, that make a story compelling. So having a relatable person, showing local impact, and then relating the person's lived experience to the broader scientific story of climate change. I'd be happy to share this resource with you. And it's great if you, uh, for anyone looking to do their own storytelling on climate change. And then finally, I think I'll just end by saying that when I say that we need to be highlighting examples of groups that are taking action, we know there are many groups here. Right, um, and Moshe has been working with Colorado Jewish Climate Action. There are others. We work closely with Dainenu uh, as part of their 2020 Hutzpah campaign, a Geo TV campaign. So get get out the vote campaign focused on alarmed Jewish voters. So with their help, they were reaching out to Jewish voters who were likely to be alarmed about climate change and getting them out to vote. And we have been blown away by how Dainenu has specifically focused on building community through Jewish art and music. Um, especially among their volunteer base during this campaign. So they, they're continuing to do incredible work and we need to be highlighting that and the work of other groups um, like many of you all on this call. So I'll stop with that now. Um, I've been talking for a while. Um, yeah, and just make some time for any questions that have come up um, through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. and. Um... We didn't ha actually have questions that came up during your talk in the chat. So um, I, I'm going to ask a, a, an initial question, and then it would be great if people wanted to um, 
uh, jump in and, and ask follow-up questions. Uh, one of the things that is important to me and important to Colorado Jewish Climate Action and the climate movement more generally is to integrate justice into the climate movement. At, at, um, and I'm curious, uh, a lot of what you talked about is to make uh, you know, these stories personal. Um, for many folks in the Jewish community, they tend to be somewhat privileged and they're not necessarily, you know, in many cases aren't going to be personally harmed. You know, that comes up a lot in here in Colorado where the people who, you know, are, are we have a really bad ozone problem and the people who are living next to the refineries are mostly, you know, black and brown folks who are not in our community. So how, how do you have suggestions for bridging those gaps, making it personal for our community that is not living next to, you know, the, the oil refinery, um, and at the same time really trying to emphasize and, and foreground uh, the place of justice in the climate movement? Absolutely. Um, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. I, I don't know if I'll be able to answer it um, do it justice. Um, but I'll give it a shot. I think that, um, I think that, yes, it's true that there are disproportionate impact that there, there are going to be disproportionate impacts of climate change and communities are already facing disproportionate impacts, um, of this crisis. But I think, I think we wouldn't be wrong to say that no place is safe or completely, um, sort of insulated from these issues, right? And so, I mean, I think we we see that we're all facing these impacts in different ways. Um, and so essentially just finding those connections and building those out. And at the same time, leaning into this sort of generational piece and this values piece where a lot of moral values talk about care for people, right? Who, especially people who are less well off than, than us. Um, and, um, um, and caring for the planet and for future generations and for our children. So thinking about how we can draw in all of those pieces. Um, so personal relevance doesn't need to just be personal impacts, but also building in those values that are important to people, personally important or relevant to the people in our communications. So I think that's how I would um, I would approach that, but I'm happy. I y'all are experts on this more than me. Um, I am not communicating uh, with specific sort of communities. So I'd love to hear, um, you know, anyone else who, if they have any thoughts on that. I think on the climate justice piece, what I will say is that we recently did a survey which found that um, a lot of Americans actually have no idea what climate justice means. Um, but when we do explain like give a short explanation of what that means and what the goals of the climate justice movement are, that a majority of people are supportive. Um, and so we need to be doing a lot more work even on that front to, to um, educate people about the goals of climate justice and how um, you know, we're, we're looking at disproportionate impacts and disproportionate abilities to deal with those impacts um, on specific communities. So I would say that we need to be doing both. Um, I would love to, to open up the floor to anybody who wants has a follow-up question. Yeah, mom. <laughs> so. Just a second. So I'm from our sister, New York. I'm Moshe's mother. But um, I feel sometimes like the myth of our, our city, oh, Rochester is so cold. You have so much snow. Well, for the last five years, we've hardly had any snow. And it hasn't been cold, that cold. And yet we're sort of like our reality is bound by this myth. And I don't know whether you have any idea of, of addressing that. But that's sort of my question. Yeah, I think that it's a challenge when, uh, when people see this as just warming, right? Um, and, and then not seeing all of the other impacts. Um, that come with um, with the issue. I think essentially what I found is that when we're having these conversations, it helps to start with people's own experiences. So asking people about their experience um, and asking them, have they, have they um, experienced any changes in their weather, in their environment? Um, the story that I had, um, I know I kind of skipped through that slide really quickly, but 
the story that I had highlighted that we broke down starts with this person um, who is a bird watcher and is just seeing that fewer and fewer birds are wintering in, in um, South Carolina. So we know that across a lot of different geographies, across the political spectrum, people are observing these changes and, and are cognizant of these changes. They're just not making the connection to the broader pattern at play here. So often sort of starting with their, letting people talk about their own experience and then using that as a jumping off point to talk about the broader patterns at play and what that means for us is a helpful strategy, I think. Uh, but again, happy to hear if others have thoughts on. Go ahead, go ahead Michael. Um, I What about also making it personal? And, and you can talk about personal in terms of uh, your your uh, wallet and your pocketbook. Um, I've heard and I've noticed personally, and I've heard from other people, their home and auto insurance has gone up. <clears throat> and that is because of, from what I understand, that more claims are because of catastrophic weather conditions. Um, yes, there's always storms and there's always floods, and but it's more and if there's anyone who keeps score of uh, damage and uh, and expense and so forth, it's the insurance companies. And so I think to bring that home, because I think a lot of our listeners, the people we will speak to, um, if they have in, you know insurance for their belongings, their house and their car, um, they will notice that that's going up. <laughs> I'm wondering if other people have other ideas of making it personal and making it, you know, how is this impacting me? You know, and uh, uh, that's something that comes up, I guess, in the Seder with the four. You know, what is uh, what does the Passover Seder mean to me? So I guess uh, other other examples, and, and uh, maybe you have those as well, of uh, it being personal. <clears throat> Anyone? <laughs> Um, hi there. Um, I can jump in on, on this one. Um, and this is really great. Um, thank you so much. Um, um, I have, so I get to work with a bunch of these folks. I'm with Adama and the Jewish Climate Leadership Coalition. And um, I live in California. And about four years ago on the night before Yom Kippur, um, which comes in the hot season here, um, San, the Bay Area had a series of what was called PSPS public safety power shutoffs. Because of climate change, fires were so severe, and so the power companies were regularly shutting down. Um, and so the synagogue, on the night before Yom Kippur, um, they had lost their power. Um, and um, really, like everyone understood a straight impact from climate change. Just so happened that at that time, I was also talking with a rabbi about becoming a resiliency center, getting solar and backup battery storage. And so it was like, we'd been talking about this for many weeks at this point, and then like this incident happened. Um, and it was like, we had been talking about um, addressing climate change and solar as a, and, and even resiliency and battery storage as a, as a public service and a, a moral call. And then like, oh, we too are impacted. Um, and so that luckily indeed the power did come back, but now, um, Fast forward, they have um, solar battery, battery storage and are on their way with the Red Cross and becoming a resiliency center. So that this hits us in all different kinds of ways. Thank you so much for sharing. And also, Micah, um, for, for bringing um, the points about um, you know how it's impacting our wallets. I think those are both super relevant. Um, <clears throat> Um, any one of us in the health field may be talking about personal health impacts. I, I know um, our congregation is five miles away from uh, Suncor, uh, which is a, um, a the only refinery in Colorado, and it's uh, highly polluting around there. Um, and the children around there, um, and again, it's black and brown people, um, lower income people, but I'm wondering, is anyone noticing, has anyone seen or personally experienced health changes or health challenges such as increases in asthma, 
I know that that's something for um, Moshe and his uh, his and his wife's uh, son, and um, you know, and and I guess his grandparents' son as well. Um, so, anyone have any things to say about that? Any health health people in the health field, public health field? Anything to share? Someone might, I think. I'll just jump in to say that um, health impacts, we know, is a message frame that is also, I mean, it's incredibly serious, but is, you know, is a message frame that uh, works with a broad set of audiences, right? Um, because um, there are these co-benefits to climate solutions that aren't about climate, right? They're also they're about people's health, um, they're about cost savings and all of these things. So also thinking strategically about how we can, you know, pull pull on these different threads with different audiences um, is um, is a good way to think about our messaging and our communication. There is a unique program to Denver um, that is focusing on home electrification, particularly of low income and health compromised individuals. And this program partners essentially with medical professionals to uh, work on communicating with patients and potential eligible partners um, to provide essentially like electrification referrals to put in a induction stove in your home and help electrify or weatherize your home to help with asthma and other respiratory diseases and illnesses. So very interesting partnership on how public health and um, medical practitioners can be involved as well in climate communication. So with, with that, um, there's lots more to say, but uh, we've come to the end of our hour. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Rabbi Sarah Blumenthal, who uh, from the Assistant Rabbi of Congregation Agudat Israel in Caldwell, New Jersey, to uh, close us out. Thank you so much, Moshe, um, and to Malika for your excellent presentation. Um, Moshe, thank you for grounding us in Torah at the beginning and um, and highlighting how the second paragraph of the Shema really speaks to the climate crisis and our need to to protect our earth. Um, it's right there in our in our sources in our in our sacred sources. So thank you for for bringing that out. And to Malika, thank you so much for sharing and teaching us how to cater our messages so that they're most effective to the communities that we speak to and that we can influence. It is so important to remember that the one of the biggest learnings I'm taking away is the the six Americas and that there are so many different um, you know, types of people and groups of people in our own country who are experiencing this in different ways. And um and to be able to to think about how to most effectively communicate with them so that um, so that we can get the message across that needs to be understood, um, but that we can do it in a way that they can actually hear and then therefore take action. So thank you so much for both of your presentations and thank you to all of you for being here and for your excellent questions and the conversation that ensued after the presentations. I hope that you, um, got a sense of what these two wonderful leaders are doing on this issue and how you can also take action and um, and contribute to, you know, finding solutions um, to the climate crisis. Um, and I want to close by encouraging everyone to register for the rest of the messy uh, webinars. We have seven to go through the weeks of learning and doing. And I'm going to put the link in the chat so that you have it right there um, to register for them. And, um, and you can sign up for the Omer calendar as well to give you some teachings on um, during this uh, sacred time, this holy time in our calendar. Um, so thank you all so much for being here for your time and for your participation. It's been a really wonderful hour to spend with you. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening and uh, an Omer um, period together. So thank you all and have a good night. Take care. Thank you so much. Let me just put the, the link in the chat before everyone leaves. There we go. That's the link in the chat to um, 
to sign up for the, the other webinars. Thank you all. And yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.